My name is Diane Hall, and I would like to welcome you to today's call, COVID-19 Vaccine Vaccination Implementation Planning Update for Rural Stakeholders. I work at CDC in the Office of the Director in the Policy and Strategy Office, where I am a senior scientist. I also have the privilege of serving as the main point of contact and coordinator for CDC's work in rural health. Our goal for the call today is to present information on COVID-19 vaccine implementation planning for our rural partners and stakeholders. We've been talking with various partner groups about vaccine planning, and we wanted to make sure that we included our rural partners. We know that strong partnerships and working together will be critical to our success in ending this pandemic. Please note this call is intended primarily for CDC's rural partners directly involved in the COVID-19 response. It is not intended for media. Should media who are listening have questions, we invite you to reach out to media at cdc.gov. We are recording this call and it will be posted on CDC's website later. It will also appear on our CDC YouTube channel. I invite you to join our COVID-19 partners list so that you can receive invitations for calls like this, as well as our COVID-19 weekly partner update calls, which occur each Monday. Note that those Monday calls focus on a variety of topics and occasionally those topics also include vaccine updates. Please click on the link in the chat box to subscribe to the COVID-19 partners email list. And while you're subscribing, you can also check out our other e-newsletters. Several of those are focused on COVID. I would like to take this opportunity to remind all of the participants on the call that our website has over 2,000 documents providing information and guidance for individuals, businesses, and the public. We also have a COVID-19 webpage that is focused on rural communities, guidance for agricultural workers and employers, guidance for transferring patients to assist with rural surge capacity issues, and we recently added the National Center for Health Statistics Urban Rural Classification to our COVID-19 data tracker. Thank you to those who sent us questions in advance. We have teed up some of those and we're also monitoring the Q&A box. So please feel welcome to submit questions there as well. We will not be actively viewing the chat box. So please use that full functionality of the Q&A box. It's located on the bottom panel of the Zoom window on your screen. I'm very pleased today to be joined by one of our experts on the COVID-19 response, Dr. Amanda Cohn. Dr. Cohn serves as the Executive Secretariat of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, and she also is the Chief Medical Officer of CDC's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, or NCIRD. Currently, she co-leads our COVID-19 uh, Vaccines Task Force. Dr. Cohn is board certified in pediatrics and is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She obtained her medical degree from Emory University School of Medicine and completed her residency in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Boston Medical Center in Massachusetts. Now with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Cohn. Apologies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Dr. Cohn. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. It is um, an honor to be able to speak to all of you about something I am both excited and hopeful and optimistic about over the next several months, and uh, but recognize that it will not be but through thousands and thousands of healthcare providers who will um, be critical to help uh, have a successful uh, COVID vaccination campaign. Next slide. There are multiple components to vaccine implementation. Um, the word implementation I'm using today to describe the whole program from getting vaccine from the manufacturer site into somebody's arm and then monitoring safety effectiveness and uh, doses and uptake of the second dose at the end of that cycle. 
Um, so I'm going to start with the first part of uh, vaccine implementation, which is considerations around prioritizing populations and allocations. Next slide. So the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices was established in 1964 by the Surgeon General. Um, this has been a committee that has provided advice to the CDC director on the most effective means to prevent vaccine preventable diseases in the U.S. population uh, since its inception. It is really the key group that uh, formulates the standard of care uh, clinical recommendations for groups to be vaccinated. Um, it advises also on which population groups and or circumstances in which a vaccine is recommended. This is a group of independent experts uh, which deliberate and inform CDC recommendations. The different uh, things that ACIP will deliver, deliberate when they're making decisions about who should be vaccinated against COVID includes disease epidemiology, the burden of disease, vaccine effectiveness and safety, um, and the quality of the evidence reviewed. So we do a full, uh, what we call a grade evidence review, uh, which includes uh, formulating uh, uh, recommendations based on the uh, data that goes into the decision-making process. Um, we also consider implementation issues. Next slide. This slide just talks about the vast number of organizations that are represented in ACIP discussions. Um, this is an example of all of the uh, uh, liaison organizations that have membership on the COVID-19 vaccines work group. Um, as you can see, it is provider organizations, public health organizations, um, and all of these groups uh, have a stake in, in, wh in what the recommendations are, but also it's important that they help inform their constituents about the ACIP recommendations. Um, so the ACIP workgroup for COVID vaccines has been meeting since March. We've been conducting uh, in-depth review of the topics to facilitate informed and efficient decision making. Uh, we have collected and analyzed all of the data, including epidemiology data. Um, we have not seen the clinical trial data from the phase three clinical trials. Uh, but data from the phase one clinical trials for uh, vaccines has been presented from some manufacturers. And ACIP will wait until all the data are available um, and FDA has authorized a vaccine to be used uh, before making a decision about which groups should uh, be recommended for vaccination. Next slide. This is a slide that talks about the different phases that we see in um, a large uh, COVID-19 vaccine implementation uh, timeline. It is this first part where we will have limited doses available and constrained supply where ACIP recommendations will be so critical in informing which populations should be prioritized to get vaccinated early. Um, during this period of time, we'll have targeted administration to um, achieve coverage in these groups that are prioritized by ACIP. Um, and we will likely have focused administration as well. There may not, depending on the number of doses available and uh, which vaccine product it is, the complexity of these vaccine products uh, may make it hard to have a vaccine sent to every provider across the country. Um, I see the question, can, can you hear me better now? Okay, um, so uh, so during this time, um, uh, we will we will have closed settings, places like hospitals, public health clinics, where people will have to travel potentially to get the vaccine, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of uh, rural settings in a few minutes. As we have more doses of vaccine available, uh, which we anticipate with COVID vaccines will happen early, uh, soon after we have um, an authorization and start using COVID vaccines, we'll have sufficient supply and we'll be able to expand our access for COVID vaccines. This is when we'll really rely on a broad administration network, um, including surge capacity. And this is when we want to use all of our um, commercial uh, 
partners are private sector partners, including doctor's offices, um, community pharmacies, uh, local health clinics, rural community health clinics. Um, and we will be um, additionally supporting and augmenting vaccine through mobile clinics, FQHCs, and, and, and focusing on communities that uh, may be harder to access or may not uh, typically have as high coverage um, uh, uh, um, and communities of color. Um, in the end, we'll shift to a routine program, um, and vaccine will be just like you use any other vaccine. Next slide. A lot of the information that I'm going to talk today about today was released in a CDC jurisdictional playbook uh, last month. Uh, this is a document that jurisdictions, primarily states and some cities, uh, are using to put together their immunization plans. This document was released last September, uh, last month. Uh, these states have used this playbook, which focuses on locating critical populations and enumerating those numbers, um, enrolling providers and providing training, uh, communicating about the vaccination program, ordering distribution and storage and handling, as well as vaccine safety monitoring. This guidance was used for the jurisdictions to develop uh, jurisdiction-specific vaccination planning. We have uh, recently had those plans submitted to CDC, and we anticipate in the next week we'll uh, be able to publish high-level executive summaries of each state's uh, plan for vaccination with COVID vaccines. Next slide. So I want to um, focus on these specific populations where it is critical to ensure access. We are thinking about these populations, whether or not they're prioritized for early access, because they will need special consideration around distribution to ensure equitable access to vaccine, both early and during the uh, middle of the vaccination program where we want to reach everyone with vaccine. Um, we have a prioritization uh, document from the National Academy of Science. And ACIP has done has completed deliber preliminary deliberations on how they would recommend prioritizing vaccines for early access. Um, ACIP will not be making any decisions about the final groups until they see um, specifically more information about the effectiveness and safety data from these products uh, in different populations uh, that were enrolled in the clinical trial, as well as the number of doses available. I think it's safe to say that those prioritized in early for early vaccination will be populations who provide critical infrastructure services like healthcare providers and other key essential workers like emergency management personnel. Um, teachers are also considered uh, essential uh, workforce uh, according to the uh, federal uh, FEMA uh, website. And so teachers would also be considered uh, in that early group for vaccination. But while we focus on that first allocation, it's also important to begin planning for populations to be prioritized in the next phase, um, such as persons at increased risk for severe illness, um, long-term care facility residents, people who uh, live in congregate settings or work in congregate settings, and persons with limited access to vaccine, like rural populations or community of communities of color and tribal nations. Um, so we're asking jurisdictions to identify and enumerate these populations now to know where they are and to identify um, a way to reach these populations early, even if these groups are not uh, recommended for early vaccination. Um, we want jurisdictions to form partnerships with trusted community organizations uh, so that information can be shared rapidly within these communities quickly. And as you can see, um, there are, I, I have included in this slide um, that people with limited access uh, may live in rural communities, but people in all of these categories um, that are critical populations live in rural settings. So we have to identify ways to vaccinate um, um, different types of individuals, such as healthcare workers or long term care facility residents who live in critical communities, uh, who live in rural communities. Next slide. So I'm going to shift over to describe vaccine distribution um, and how that will um, 
uh, impact uh, uh, administration at, in, in rural communities as well as throughout the country. Next slide. This is an overview of how vaccine will dis be distributed down to the administration site. Um, vaccine will come from the manufacturer um, and will be sent to a centralized distributor. At the same time, ancillary supplies and personal protect, uh, protective equipment um, and any additional supplies that are needed, such as an adjuvant or diluent, will be packaged and also sent to that same distributor. So when providers receive vaccine, they will be getting vaccine and the ancillary supply kits together um, so that providers do not have to worry about having ancillary supplies to, to be able to vaccinate uh, their populations. Um, states and jurisdictions will order against a defined allocation of vaccine as it becomes available and will direct it to a variety of administration sites in that phase rollout as discussed. So for example, if we have 20 million doses of vaccine, we'll divide that in what we call a pro rata, um, a pro rata distribution so that every state has a proportional number of doses, but the decisions about exactly where those doses go will be based off of the health department's understanding of, of their community and their uh, critical groups um, based off of ACIP prioritization. So for example, um, there may be far fewer doses of vaccine available um, than a state would need to vaccinate all of their healthcare and critical infrastructure workers. Um, but one state um, may determine that agriculture, uh, people working in agriculture are a critical workforce because it is the time of year where um, uh, they will need a large um, uh, they will need um, a large workforce to uh, uh, for their agricultural community, um, whereas another state, for example, may determine that public transportation um, and bus drivers are critical workforce. So those decisions will be made at the local level, um, but we do anticipate that supply will increase quickly um, so that uh, vaccines will be available to a wider group of people as um, time passes. Um, as vaccine becomes more available, um, commercial partners like pharmacies will be given direct allocations to expand the footprint of vaccination sites across the country. So we're working with uh, large chain pharmacies um, as well as community-based pharmacies to ensure that uh, people have access to vaccines through both their providers' offices as well as pharmacies. We know that almost 90% of Americans live within a 10-mile radius of a pharmacy. And we know that some groups, especially older adults, don't like to receive their vaccines in pharmacies. This does provide an additional footprint to get vaccine out to rural communities. Next slide. Um, I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the um, administration of uh, vaccine. Next slide. One key piece of vaccine administration is making sure we have the uh, a, a large workforce of vaccinators, of healthcare providers who can administer vaccine, particularly in the early phases when we want to reach critical populations. We're focusing jurisdictional planning on providers who can rapidly reach those initial populations, uh, uh, like healthcare personnel, as soon as vaccine is available. For subsequent planning, we're asking jurisdictions to expand the recruitment of providers to ensure equitable access to critical populations and to the general public. Providers are trusted members of our community, and it's important to work with these with, with provider partners um, and national medical organizations to make sure we have the recruitment of many different types of providers to ensure access. Um, there are several steps for providers to onboard to be able to give vaccines, and these steps are critical for providers to take to take early to ensure that they are able to uh, give vaccine and maintain the integrity of vaccine and storage and handling of the product. Um, and we also need to build um, confidence in the provider community around these products as more information becomes available. Next slide. Um, this 
slide uh, demonstrates what um, some of the multiple considerations that have to be taken into account for administrating COVID vaccines during the COVID pandemic. Um, regardless of whether a clinic is a mass vaccination clinic, a drive through operation, or housed in a health center, uh, these considerations apply, such as maintaining social distancing and infection control guidance um, has to be maintained uh, during vaccine clinic management. This means really spacing out people more and scheduling appointments to avoid overcrowding. Storage and handling capacity of frozen products. Um, there, is, there is a lot of complexity in the different types of products. And one of these products is an ultra cold, uh, uh, requires ultra cold freezing, which means negative 60 to 80 degrees. Another product requires negative 20 degrees. What I will say that's really important to understand at this time is that we will be providing the storage requirements for ultra cold storage management of vaccine product. So for example, providers and health clinics and rural health clinics will be able to order the number of doses that they need and uh, in real time and understanding the number of days that the, the number of people they're vaccinating a day and being able to, um, and having data on the number of days that the vaccine is stable in a refrigerator, for example, is it seven days or 10 days? Then they can accurately reflect what they can order um, and use without increasing uh, wastage. So ultra cold product will come in its own shipping container that maintains the cold chain for up to 10 days with dry ice. Um, and the cold product has to be uh, frozen at negative 20 degrees, but can also be maintained at, um, at refrigeration for uh, seven days. So security may also be concerned at a concern at some of these clinics and making sure that clinic staff and patrons are safe is a key to the clinic design. Finally, Clinics must have the ability to have time to speak with patients and provide them with the information required by an emergency use authorization. This, these vaccines will likely be authorized by FDA under an emergency use authorization uh, rather than a, the full licensure, pro, uh, full licensure application. And this will allow vaccine to be implemented in the United States um, several months earlier while at the same time maintaining the, um, the requirements for safety and effectiveness. Um, the information has to be provided to the patient so that they return for their second dose in 21 or 28 days. Um, they have a good experience in the clinic and uh, they will want to come and, um, and counseling on vaccine safety will go a long way to ensuring that they come back to the clinic for that second dose. It is also required that uh, individuals get the same vaccine for their second dose. These products are very different. Um, so being able to uh, track which products a patient received will be critical. Next slide. This is a guidance that CDC has put out around providing uh, immunization services safely. And this correlates with the CDC framework for providing non-COVID-19 uh, clinical care. It includes considerations for use of PPE um, and considerations of various clinical settings for vaccine administration. For example, you may want to have a single room to administer vaccine in um, and close off your clinic or have a separate entrance. Um, there are uh, specific considerations for high-risk populations for both influenza and COVID infection. Um, including those at high risk for complications from COVID or influenza, um, those at high risk for severe disease from COVID, and essential workers. Next slide. Um, there are additional considerations around administration for rural communities. People living in rural communities tend to be older, lower socioeconomic status, and more likely to have chronic conditions, which may put them at risk of getting COVID-19, as well as having more severe illness from COVID-19. Therefore, getting vaccine coverage high in rural settings uh, will be a really important um, part of our uh, overall ability to control this pandemic, um, as we're seeing, unfortunately, right now, 
uh, with, uh, with outbreaks surging in rural populations. Um, rural healthcare infrastructure is frequently strained, as, as many of you know, by shortages of healthcare professionals, which may limit an individual's access to primary and specialty care and by hospital closes, closures. Public health infrastructure is also strained in rural settings, with large reason, regions supported by single rural public health departments. Rural areas may have limited access to digital technology, such as internet access, smartphones, and cellular network services. All of these considerations make planning to vaccinate in rural communities all that much more important. Um, we um, anticipate that getting vaccine to rural communities early may involve things like mobile clinics um, to reach critical populations and healthcare workforce in rural settings. Um, we also have a program that uh, where uh, CVS and Walgreens will be directly supporting long-term care facilities so that long-term care facilities will have um, easier access early in the program to vaccine. Um, and then we anticipate, as more doses are available, rapidly scaling up availability through uh, community, uh, community uh, pharmacies and community health care centers to try to make sure that people vaccine gets as close to people as it possibly can. Next slide. And finally, I'm going to talk about the safety um, and effectiveness work that is so important to this entire program. Next slide. So safety is a priority during all phases of vaccine development, approval, and use. Um, we monitor the safety of vaccines post-licensure for every vaccine that is recommended in the United States. Um, but monitoring COVID-19 vaccine safety uh, will be a large-scale coordinated effort by multiple federal agencies, and we will need help from all of you to do this. Um, we will use our, our, our regular systems, such as VAERS reporting and many of our large uh, healthcare databases that we use to understand whether or not a safety signal um, is causal and related to a vaccine, to receive a vaccine, um, but we'll also be implementing new strategies such as um, a tool we call vSafe, where individuals can enroll to be actively monitored um, for uh, up to six weeks after they get vaccinated um, so that we can make sure that if there is an adverse event, that adverse event gets reported um, uh, adequately. Next slide. So our vaccine safety strategy is intricately linked to um, my next topic, which will be building vaccine confidence. Um, we need to have as robust of a vaccine safety monitoring um, uh, program as we had a vaccine development program. And we will be using established systems to implement heightened safety monitoring. We'll be developing new platforms, such as the one I just described called vSafe. And What's really important is that we communicate clearly on the vaccine safety process and systems now, but also provide frequent updates on vaccine safety data and monitoring results once these are available. Um, we want to um, make sure that safety is, of, safety is the highest priority during the implementation process. This does not mean that these vaccines have been studied um, in fewer people in any way, shape, or form. So I, I do want to make clear that these vaccine clinical trials that are ongoing have enrolled up to 30,000 participants, which is um, either the same, just as big, or even larger than many clinical trials which enroll, um, for, which evaluate vaccine safety before full licensure. Um, the difference with this emergency use authorization is that uh, we are following individuals for a shorter period of time before looking at the vaccine safety data from this, these clinical trials. We know that almost all vaccine safety adverse event concerns happen uh, less than um, up frequently before six weeks and almost always before eight weeks after getting vaccinated. Um, but we want to make sure that we have every system in place to um, monitor uh, the millions of people that will be vaccinated. So we detect even rare adverse events and, and can implement um, action if needed. 
Next slide. Um, and our communications and guidance will really be the, um, the backbone of this entire implementation process. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, concerns and misinformation about vaccines are not new. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows um, an 1802 cartoon which highlighted fears that uh, inoculating with cowpox to prevent smallpox would actually turn the patients into cows. Next slide. Um, what we understand about vaccine confidence and hesitancy is that there are a small portion of people that will refuse all vaccines. Um, there are also a small number of people who will jump in line first for every vaccine. Most people fall on this vaccine demand continuum where some will um, accept vaccine, some may step back and wait and see um, what happens in the first couple of months, and, and some may decide not to get vaccinated. But this is a very new vaccine, and there are a lot of valid questions out there. There is absolutely misinformation, and I don't want to um, I don't want to diminish the um, impact of misinformation and disinformation, but there's also lots and lots of questions about the vaccine process, and, and people want to uh, have these questions heard and answered, and they want to make an informed decision. Next slide. Next slide. So what factors influence decisions about vaccination? Um, We'll divide these into three different groups. Uh, the first is contextual, so media and public communication, local politics, religion, culture, accessibility of services, and trust in authorities. All of these will have, um, all rural communities will have a different context than suburban and urban communities, but every rural community will have their own context um, that they will have to address all of these different issues that may inform um, people's willingness and acceptance uh, to get vaccinated when COVID vaccines are, are authorized. There's also individual and group influences, such as beliefs and attitudes about health and disease prevention, knowledge and awareness, and previous poor uh, quality health experiences. Um, so for example, in this group, we know that older individuals who have experienced um, outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases like polio and measles in their childhoods um, are more likely to accept vaccine than, than um, younger adults who uh, think that they're invincible. Um, there's also vaccine and vaccine-specific issues, such as the mode of administration, the source of the vaccine, the schedule, costs that may be associated, and the knowledge and attitudes of the healthcare professionals that they engage with when making the decision to vaccinate. Um, I always say that one of my three daughters is, is vaccine hesitant. Uh, what she really is, is needle phobic, uh, and she will never choose to get a vaccine. You really have to convince her that this is really important for her health, and then she will overcome her fear of getting vaccinated, um, uh, and, and that will address her hesitancy. Next slide. We've done some formative research over the summer um, looking at COVID vaccine um, awareness and knowledge and understanding. Um, almost all of the groups that we uh, engaged for focus groups were aware of COVID vaccines and development. Um, many expressed skepticism. And as I said earlier, participants were really asking very knowledgeable questions about wanting to understand safety and effectiveness more, what would be the side effects, both immediate and um, in the longer term? What is the testing pro uh, process? And who was the vaccine tested on? Was it tested on my demographic? Were people like me vaccinated as part of the clinical trial? Next slide. Um, sources uh, of and trusted sources of information varied by audience segment. So older segments relied on news establishments for information and trusted their personal doctor. Younger, uh, younger individuals usually went to social media. 
Um, trusted organizations uh, did include CDC, NIH, and state and local health departments. Um, and individuals who were cited frequently were Dr. Fauci and um, frankly, relatives who were healthcare workers have a huge influence on their family and uh, social networks, um, as, long as, as well as certain media figures and celebrities. What we heard from most of these uh, focus groups was that people were open to getting vaccinated eventually. They just wanted to understand the data, understand what those around them thought they should do, and uh, wanted to wait a little bit. Next slide. So based on um, prior experience with uh, vaccine confidence and uh, this formative research that was conducted, uh, CDC realigned uh, our vaccinate with confidence strategy, which was really built around childhood vaccines to reinforce vaccine confidence for COVID vaccines. There are three different pillars of this vaccinate with confidence strategy. And, um, all three of these will be really important in, in all communities um, to implement. Um, the first is that we've got to reinforce trust. We need to regularly share clear and accurate COVID-19 vaccine information and take visible actions to build trust. We have to share what we do know and what we don't know, and we have to share this information in ways that people can digest and understand. We also need to empower healthcare providers. We need to promote confidence among healthcare personnel and their own decision to get vaccinated because that decision to get vaccinated will be reflected in their strong recommendation to their patient population and to their family members and those around them to get vaccinated. Um, so we really want to rely on our healthcare personnel, which doesn't just mean the doctors and nurses. People consider healthcare personnel and patients see everyone they interact with in a healthcare setting as important in their healthcare decision making. And we have to have a, an all of uh, healthcare approach to increasing vaccine confidence. Finally, and, and really one of the um, most challenging um, uh, strategies to implement is that we need to engage communities and individuals, and we need to practice equitable and inclusive community engagement. And this is a national strategy that has to be implemented at the very, very local level. Um, so we want to support communities with content and materials, and we want communities to have listening sessions with different populations and understand um, what their community needs to support a, a strong uh, vaccination program um, when the time comes. Next slide. Um, we need to rise to the challenge to achieve high coverage with both seasonal influenza and COVID vaccines. We know that vaccine coverage with seasonal influenza vaccine is not high enough to impact this COVID-19 pandemic um, as quickly or rapidly as we would like. Um, we typically achieve about 50% coverage in adults with, uh, COVID, with influenza vaccines. And we know that vaccination coverage of racial and ethnic minorities is consistently lower than that of white populations. We also know that between and within jurisdictions, influenza vaccine coverage for rural Americans is generally lower than for non-rural Americans, although the coverage rates can vary widely. So we need novel and more robust strategies to increase uptake of both influenza vaccines and COVID vaccines once they're available. And I really do want to encourage um, uh, all of you to think about this influenza vaccination season, uh, which hopefully all of you have uh, gotten vaccinated and, and had those around you vaccinated, including patients, um, as really a building block for, um, for building trust and um, supporting COVID vaccination. Next slide. Risk communication methods need to be applied now. Um, we need to communicate early and often in ways that people trust. Um, it should not always be public health who's communicating these messages. We need to amplify our messages through um, partner organizations um, and provider organizations. We need to communicate clearly and with compassion. We need to acknowledge and communicate uncertainty. This is really important. I think the more that we, um, uh, the more that we don't share information that we don't know, the more we say 
the less we say we don't know, the more people uh, lack trust in, in what we do know and what we do say. We need to be transparent, honest, and frank. And we need to listen and respond to specific concerns of stakeholders, including the public. Um, and we need to deliver these messages through multiple media modes, reading levels, and cultural competence. Um, so we need to um, approach vaccine confidence from um, all angles and really engage um, an all of community approach to, to uh, increase vaccine uptake. Next slide. So what do I want you to take from uh, today? Um, I want everyone to understand that this is a complicated vaccine landscape, many different types of vaccine in development um, and are in development and may be authorized by FDA. But no matter how quickly vaccines are developed, CDC and FDA are deploying their routine procedures and systems to ensure vaccines are safe and effective. Who is recommended will, uh, to get vaccinated will evolve over time. We do anticipate that when we first start vaccinating, hopefully by the end of this year, uh, there will be limited vaccine doses and we will prioritize and focus on those groups recommended um, by our advisory committees. But we do anticipate supply will increase and we want eventually to have very high uptake in the population. Um, we also know that vaccines will initially be used only in adults. Um, COVID-19 vaccine planning is changing rapidly and new information will always be available. Um, many of you may not have um, been uh, connected with your local or state health department about engaging and becoming vaccine providers. That's okay. Uh, these health departments are focusing on these very, very early vaccine uh, providers that will distribute large number of doses and thinking about creative and novel ways to reach um, all of their communities. But very soon they will be reaching out to a broader um, group of providers um, to ensure that uh, we have as many providers on board to vaccinate as we can uh, to reach uh, all, of, uh, all of America. Um, as a trusted source of information when it comes to vaccines, healthcare providers play a critical role in helping build confidence. Um, and as I've already suggested, um, getting your flu shot this year and, and recommending that um, all of uh, uh, those in your clinic get vaccinated um, is more important this year than ever. Next slide. I'll end uh, with what you can do now. Um, I know everyone wants to start vaccinating as quickly as possible to, um, to impact this uh, pandemic, but I do encourage you while we're waiting to make sure that the data um, do support authorizing these vaccines, that you know where to go for the latest and accurate information on COVID vaccines, and you understand your uh, healthcare organization or facilities plan for vaccination. Um, we want everyone to help carry the message and um, know that you are a trusted source who understands your audience and constituents um, best. Next slide. Um, and this is just so you all have the uh, vaccine web content that we do anticipate we'll be updating uh, weekly as uh, weekly or every other week um, as more information becomes available on these vaccines. Next slide. And uh, I want to end by thanking you for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. That information was very helpful, and we do have a lot of questions. Um, I'm already predicting that we're not going to get through to through all of them, but I do want to assure folks on the phone that just knowing the questions you have is very helpful for us. And if you've posted those in the Q&A box, we will have a record of them, uh, which will be very helpful to us moving forward. So uh, first question, Dr. Cohn, has to do with um, storing vaccines and uh, concerned that some of them require ultra cold storage. Is CDC recommending that our partners purchase equipment to allow for that storage? Uh, this is a really important point to make. We do not recommend that uh, anyone, uh, any partner uh, purchase uh, equipment to store this vaccine at ultra cold temperatures. Um, these vaccines will come in shipping containers that will keep these vaccines at that temperature. 
and um, and you will pull out the vaccine um, as needed, and um, and then these vaccines can be refrigerated. What's what's most important is that people sort through and understand how many people they think they will be vaccinating in a day, because that will help with their ordering of vaccine, which will really support not wasting um, vaccine. Because once the vaccine has come to a provider, it will last for 10 days at that ultra cold storage in that container um, and will last for a certain period of time in the refrigerator. So we've got a it's managing inventory and supply, not by purchasing additional storage equipment, but by um, trying to um, to know uh, how many doses you'll need. Great, thank you. We also received some questions uh, concerning education. So one is that it seems like there will be a good bit of training that's needed in terms of vaccine management, distribution, safety. Do you know if anyone is working on developing training? And a related question is, do you know if there will be vaccine education sheets available like there are for other vaccines? Absolutely. We are um, developing the training as we speak. Um, we anticipate that these training, um, this content will um, start to become available uh, mid to late November. Um, and we will require um, providers to go through this training. Um, well, states, jurisdictions will require vaccine providers to go through this training before they receive vaccine. We will make it easily accessible. You'll be able to access it at any time. Um, these will be short videos. Um, but even just training materials around how to manage this, um, these shipping containers and um, how, to, uh, how to mix the vaccine and how to administer it, um, that will all be done. The companies themselves are required to provide this information to providers who are administering the EUA. And this also includes patient and provider uh, fact sheets. Um, but we will be continuously updating our websites as well with general training material as well as vaccine specific uh, uh, training materials um, uh, over the next several weeks. Thank and you. we'll be advertising and making sure that we'll be, we'll be reaching out um, in through multiple ways to make sure providers are aware of that when it comes available. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we also have some questions about safety and efficacy data. And so people are asking how they can find information on the clinical trials, um, both safety and efficacy. And hold on, I'm scrolling. Um, just how confident are we that this information will be available? And where do you think that information would be available? So the safety and efficacy information that is available now is from the phase one clinical trials and early phase two. It's, it's in very limited numbers of people. It gave um, FDA and the companies enough evidence to support moving into these larger phase three clinical trials, most of which have enrolled um, or are enrolling um, more than um, 30,000 uh, uh, participants um, for each product. This data will be available. Um, at this time, the, um, the companies uh, which use data safety monitoring boards have not unblinded their data. So when they have collected enough data so that they think they'll be able to understand safety and effectiveness, they will um, they will unblind the data and they will review their data and determine if it um, supports submitting to FDA. If the company submits the data to FDA, um, FDA will, uh, will review the data and they will also have um, a federal advisory committee, which is called VRPAC, um, and they will have a public meeting where this data will be presented. Um, so not only will it be presented at the public meeting, but it will also likely be available in some form um, on the um, as uh, publicly available content before that meeting. Um, additionally, ACIP will have a public meeting where all of the safety and effectiveness data will be presented and um, all of those slides and information will be available um, publicly. We, um, CDC and FDA, are really committed to making sure that all of this data is both uh, uh, 
public and um, and, and accessible, uh, as well as reviewed by independent advisory committees uh, uh, as uh, as decisions are made about these vaccines moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, we also received some questions asking about who's considered uh, critical populations or healthcare workers. Do you know who makes those determinations and where people can find that information? Um, so the the federal definition of essential workforce um, is actually a FEMA definition that includes um, all sorts of essential workforce for critical infrastructure. Um, we we typically break these down into um, Healthcare workers, uh, first responders, um, which would include um, uh, uh, EMS are considered healthcare workers, um, but also firemen, policemen. Um, but then it also includes, as I said earlier, teachers and groups that um, you know keep um, keep all of our structures running. Um, you know, people who are working at our electrical plants and and, and our agricultural. Uh, uh, our, our plant, uh, meat processing plants and, and things like that. Um, there's a website that um, we can try to find and put up for uh, in the chat in a minute um, where those populations are, are talked about um, and that's on the FEMA website. Um, however, what I, you know, ACIP will make these big decisions. Um, the state health departments and, and the jurisdictions so state health departments, tribal nations, and um, will be making decisions about how to prioritize within that essential workforce population. So in the very beginning, we do not anticipate having enough doses to vaccinate that wide population. And so we'll have to, uh, it'll be the states that will make uh, determinations about how they want to focus their doses. And for example, even in a hospital, people will have to decide if you're an accountant in the hospital and have no direct patient care, you may not be prioritized, but if you are um, uh, cleaning in the hospital or uh, providing direct clinical care, those individuals may be prioritized. So um, jurisdictions will be reaching out to, hosp uh, uh, to uh, these groups and start to, to talk them through how to make those plans within their uh, organizations. Great, thank you so much. Um, what about vaccines for children or teens? You mentioned that the focus will be adults first. Do you have any information you can share about yes. children and teens? Sure, so um, right now all the clinical trials until very recently uh, have been conducted in 18 years of age or older. Um, one of the products um, has now started enrolling down to 12 years of age. And so uh, we anticipate having data on uh, safety and efficacy in a uh, teenage population for that one product um, in the next uh, couple of months. Um, so um, we, we understand that multiple companies are going to be going down in age for these vaccine studies, but we do want to ensure that we have um, safety data to support um, vaccinating widely in um, children and teens. And so we will have to wait for those clinical trials to be done, um, which will be months, um, you know, several months um, away. Thank you. Um, so there's a question related to that. Do you know um, when we get to the point where we have vaccines, if those would be available through the Vaccines for Children program? So these vaccines have all been purchased by the federal government already, so they will be available to everyone free of charge. So for example, if you are a doctor in a rural community, you will not have to buy vaccine either through VFC or not, well, you don't buy it through VFC, you won't have to order it through VFC or um, buy it for your privately insured populations. It will all be distributed through VTRAX and essentially the same foundations that we distribute vaccines for children vaccine through. Um, additionally, um, there will be forthcoming information about administration fees, uh, but we anticipate that these vaccines should be available at no cost to an individual and uh, no cost to the providers who are administrating the vaccine. Of, um, uh, so technically it will not be included in the vaccine for children program as part of this large program. I do anticipate at some point it will be incorporated in the vaccines for children program. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, we always get a question, do you have an estimate on when you think the first vaccines may be available? <laughs> um, I think that the companies have um, talked about having enough data to look at their data and potentially submit to the FDA in uh, mid to late November. Uh, so I think the earliest possible time would be uh, early to mid December. Um, I do hope that the data are conclusive enough that we're able to start vaccinating uh, before the end of the year. But um, you know, it's I I I, I uh, do not think we will vaccinate. Uh, I think it'll be just at the end of the year, frankly. Okay. We won't hold you to that. We, yeah. It was an estimate. We did ask you for an yeah. estimate. Um, one of the concerns that we hear frequently, and I'm going to summarize a bunch of different questions, um, there's concern about vaccine distribution and how those decisions will be made. So we have one specific example. Uh, during H1N1, there were some rural communities in a state where they only received one vaccine in the community because it was based on population. Do you have any insights into what that might look like for our rural partners? Well, I hope they meant vaccine product and not literally one dose. Um, I, uh, as these products become available, um, we we are we have less we have many lessons learned from H1N1, including um, the importance and, and complexities of distributing vaccine to uh, rural communities. And um, we will continue to be working on this. Early, when we don't have lots of doses, I frankly do not anticipate that vaccine will be widely available in every rural community. Um, persons who are recommended to get vaccine, uh, local health uh, departments are really gonna have to work with those communities to, to get vaccine to individuals, either through mobile clinics and things like that. And, and the reason is because this ultra cold vaccine and this frozen vaccine has such stringent storage and handling requirements that um, we can't ship them uh, to every community early. Um, I do think that we are continuing to get more stability data and more information about these products and, and additional products um, do not have those same types of restrictions. Um, we are being very creative. I think um, directly shipping to pharmacies, including community pharmacies, many of which are in rural communities, um, we're hopeful is, is a strategy that will um, allow, um, allow uh, us to ensure well, our goal is to get vaccines to all Americans, not make Americans have to find vaccine. Um, I don't. I imagine that the first couple of months will be um, not ideal, um, but we really want to listen to our rural partners and understand what we can do to make it better, both early and when we have uh, a plenty of doses to to reach populations. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cohn, we're at our time. Do you have any closing remarks or additional thoughts you'd like to share? Maybe reminding people that they really should get a flu shot if they haven't done so. <laughs> um, I, 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 we can reiterate that point, but I really just want to thank um, all of you for taking the time to listen. And um, I know that everyone is exhausted. The last several months of this have been so straining on our healthcare community and um, on all communities. And um, this uh, implementing vaccine is um, will take all of our community and we um, really want to hear your feedback as much as possible um, now so that we can best incorporate it into our plans. So um, please reach out um, with uh, any feedback and, and, and really talk to your uh, local and state health departments about uh, feedback because it's really that local planning that's going to be so critical. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for joining us. As Dr. Cohn mentioned, this is a very complicated landscape and information is changing rapidly. We will continue to provide vaccine information on our partner update calls, such as the one I mentioned uh, that happens every Monday. So please do subscribe. I think we're able to get the um, fixed link there and our apologies for that. Thank you for joining us today. We did record this session and it will be posted online on our website and it will also be available on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us at ruralhealth@cdc.gov. And with that, we will sign off. Thank you, everyone.